So this is lecture six of ECE 503. So in this lecture, what we're going to be looking at is um, essentially how we use Z transforms in order to analyze data. Um, like essentially uh, signals, systems, they all have telltale, tell, telltale characteristics that the Z transform would be able to sort of bring out in the analysis. Okay? So in particular, we're going to look at how can we tell if a system's causal, how we can tell it's bounded, and this is all based off of like, you know, the, the, the Z transform and how the poles and zeros are laid out in it. So um, we've just looked at Z transforms. We looked at partial fraction expansion, rational Z transforms, their properties. Now let's start using these Z transforms to do a little bit of analysis. So um, we, we already saw this guy here. Remember? So this is actually quite powerful. So if you look at So if you look at the Z transform, so suppose I have a system. And so this is where it's really useful, especially if it's an LTI system. So let's say you have an LTI system, and it's represented by H of n, and you have X of n, and you have Y of n. And we saw how those guys look like too, right? Um, so if it's like a DF1 or a DF2, system, it has like an array of delays, adds, multiplies, and the like. And so we also saw that in order to get an output, y of n, things get kind of messy um, in terms of like now I have an x of n, I convolve it with an h of n in order to get my response. And, and this could be messy. Messy. Actually, that's the name of a friend's cat that I know. So uh, instead, what I would do is Let's say we take this guy and we find his Z equivalent. So if we take the Z transform of X of N, we get X of Z. Um, and same thing with Y. If we take the Z transform of Y of N, we get Y of Z. And then we call the Z transform, as we saw in the last lecture, the Z transform of our impulse response, we call it the system function, and that's called H of Z. And that Y of Z, in this case, is equal to, based on the properties of the Z transform, a convolution in the time domain is a multiplication in the frequency domain, and we have that. And we also saw that using this relationship, we can very quickly get the system function based on solely the input and output Z transforms, right? Very powerful stuff. Because if we know what the input uh, Z transform looks like and the output Z transform, then from the two, we can create the system function and then we can characterize a lot of stuff. So, hey. <laughs> so from that, so let's, let's revisit. So, like what we saw here, remember this, this H, we can rewrite it in terms of a polynomial of Z's and the numerator and the denominator. And so we have some sort of rational form. And then what we saw is that we can rewrite this guy um, in, in terms of, um, again, a bunch of poles and a bunch of zeros. So the, yeah, so P, K represents pole, right? So P, K is the kth pole. And QK, yeah, you would think ZK, but no, ZK would be too confusing. Um, QK is the, the, the zero. So, so why do, maybe as an aside, why do we call these poles and zeros? Other than the fact that it sounds really, really cool. And here's the reason why. Uh, here we go. So the reason is this. So let's say we have that format. So let's say we have our H of Z. And so what we have is we have Z minus Q1. That's the first pole. Uh, sorry, first zero. Big, sorry about that. Q2, Z minus Q3, Z minus QM. So let's say there are M poles, um, M zeros. And then we have Z minus P1. Z minus P2, 
z minus p3 all the way to z minus pn. And those are, so here, the qk's are, uh, are zeros, and the pk's P are poles. And the reason why these are called zeros is suppose, in this case, this, trans this system function, if z is equal to one of those qk's, the entire system function goes to zero, right? Any one of those roots, right, the numerator roots, if, it, if z is equal to qk, so let's say it's this guy here, what happens? Zero. Numerator goes to zero, the whole system function goes to zero. That, that I can live with. That I can live with. If my system function goes to zero, I'm cool because it's not exploding. Exploding stuff I don't like. Now, on the other hand, if z, k, z is equal to pk, I'm now worried. So basically, the poles are what I'm worried about because that represents discontinuities in my system function. When I have discontinuities in my system function, this signifies that I'm not going to have a solution there. More importantly, I want to avoid it because then my system becomes unstable, right? So, so, that, so, that's, so that's a little bit of a backgrounder behind the poles and zeros here. Whew, sound effects. Don't need them. So, in this case, so we have now this representation of, of poles and zeros, right, for, for our transfer function, or the relationship between the input and the output. And so, again, just like before, we can decompose these guys into, in this case, um, something called a natural response um, uh, or the transient response and the force response or steady state response. So what we can do is we can decompose the output into these two sets of responses. So, so each one depends on how we excite the system. So it's all based on what we're doing with the system. So there's a natural response which, in, um, uh, you know, like, well, the, so the natural response is, uh, when we, we don't feed any sort of, um, we, don't, we don't trigger anything in it. We don't, we, like as the name implies, as in the second case, the force response, we actually put a signal in it in order to trigger an output. And the, and the natural response does not, right? Given that we have this, these feedback elements and the like. And so when we have the combination of the two, we can actually create, um, when we have these two, sum them together to create the overall response of the system. But that's not so much what I'm, I care about right now. So I mentioned to you about, um, in particular, using Z transforms to analyze that H. And this is, what, this is where it comes in. So it's the causality and stability of this LTI system. And so, OK, so you're seeing a lot of these uh, um, you know, regions of convergences and these um, rings and these R's. And some are contained and some are not. So uh, you might, and I think, I, I feel like I've been doing a, a sort of a poor job articulating it. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it right now. So this is what I mean. So you might wonder, where the heck am I getting, like, let's say for h of z. So I'm just going to redraw this thing, OK? OK? And so what happens is suppose we represent, you know, this is our z plane. OK? So what we want to do is this is sort of our coordinate system for um, for our poles and zeros. And remember that z's are r, e, minus j, theta. So it's a polar form. And that means what happens is we can um, position it anywhere in this plane. And so what's interesting is we, we uh, usually, OK, so here's a legend. So legend. So this equals, this is, when you see an x on a z plane, it means a pole. 
And when you have a little circle, that means a zero, right? And so what ends up happening is you, you might have a zero here, you might have a zero here, um, you might have conjugate zeros there or something. That's fine. So in your, in, in your z plane, when you have, let's say, a value, um, like, you know, let's say z assumes that value, uh, that just means that your system function is just going to become zero. What, again, what I'm more interested in is if you have this. Right? Almost looks like a football play. <laughs> what, what ends up happening is actually that's something that I'm very concerned about. Um, what ends up happening is let's say you have these two guys. So let's say this guy's pole one and he's pole two. Let's say they're conjugate poles. They're the same distance. Right? They're the same distance away from the origin. Um, and they're just like angle wise, they're kind of like, again, mirror images. Like this could be theta one, uh, that could be minus theta one. Uh, this could be R1, and that's R1. So now you might ask, okay, um, uh, what do I do now? So depending, first of all, on the type of uh, system that you have, uh, what you need to decide is what is your ROC? So the question is ROC. So remember, like, you know, everything we saw up, like in the last lecture and this lecture, we got that funny circle, and then we say, Everything outside of the circle is the region of convergence, or everything inside the circle is the region of convergence, right? You might say, well, who's defining that circle? And I, I talked about roots, 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 and everyone's like, oh, oh, roots, what, 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 what roots? Roots are the zero roots, the roots of the denominator. So they will define the locations of the poles in the z-plane. We know that we cannot contain in the region of convergence any poles. So Region of convergence, I'm going to write it in caps, cannot contain poles. Okay? That's where you're getting that circle. Zeros under your hand, totally cool. Zeros are cool. I can have zeros because the thing is they don't cause any instability. I can have a region of convergence and have tons of zeros in there. So now what happens is based on your waveform, right, on your system function, you can either now have a region of convergence that contains the outside of that circle or you can have a region of convergence that's within the circle. But you cannot, absolutely not, have a region of convergence that contains the circle. Right? And the, region is, the reason is, OK, well, professor, um, as, what happens if I'm over here? I'm not touching that or that. Right? Doesn't hurt anyone. And the reason is, that's fine. But what happens is, for like, you know, that phase term, again, if you take the magnitude response, remember when we did the region of convergence it does not matter with the phase. It only really matters with that magnitude response, in which case, uh, if I am any distance away, right, all we cared about is the restriction of R. How far, like, you know, so if there's a pole at R1, it doesn't matter where, which phase it is, R1's off limits. We don't want to take that risk. So that is a do not touch area. So we cannot touch that. And so now that ring is off limits. So now a region of convergence, since it needs to be a continuum, we either go out to infinity or we go into the unit circle. And that will depend on what your time representation is. In fact, that's a great segue <coughs> into the analysis about causality. Because it turns out that if you want your system to look causal, Right? If you say, I want this system to be causal, then what happens is your region of convergence goes out to infinity. Okay? So, so this is how we're selecting ROC based on once we find out where the poles are. Right? Is our region convergence goes off to infinity if we want it, the system to be causal. And we have it, the region of convergence go to zero if we want it to be not causal, anti-causal. All right? And I kind of explained it here. Now, the Bebo, okay, 
the, uh, you know, that's actually kind of cool. So Bebo stability, that's a little bit of a trick there too. So Bebo stability depends on whether your region of convergence, regardless if it goes out or goes in. The big deciding factor of Bebo stability, use a different color, is whether, let's say in this case here, it contains a unit circle. So if your ROC contains a unit circle, stable, that's, that's, that's the fingerprint of, like, you know, the clue, or basically the giveaway saying, if your ROC contains a unit circle, stable. Right? That's all you need to look for. If it doesn't, it's not stable. Forget about it. Sorry. Right? And that's actually articulated in the, um, like, there's a little bit of a proof in the book, but, but, but you know, just, just for, uh, you know, rules of thumb or whatever, um, if you do not include, uh, so, so in fact, it's here. Um, if you have, let's say, the magnitude of your system function, and you uh, take the magnitude now, the z, transform the um, a definition of taking of h of, uh, h of n, and you work it all the way down, what you notice is that you get, uh, when you let um, the absolute value of, or magnitude of z equal 1, what you end up getting is that you establish your, your boundedness uh, by taking, like, you know, through this expression. So what happens is if you let the, the magnitude of z, so basically the radius from the origin, uh, basically extend out to the unit circle, what you get is that uh, your system function is going to be bounded. All right. Last but not least, um, pole zero cancellation. So um, what it turns out, what happens if you have a root in the numerator and a root to the denominator, and they're identical? They'll cancel out, right? So we go back to that form. <coughs> what happens if Q1 is equal to P1? You, you cross it out, right? The same thing happens in this case. So let's say I now have, let's say here, just by fluke, I have a pole and I have a zero on top of each other. They'll cancel out. So you might say, well, isn't that a problem? Well, what, what, would that cause a discontinuity? Would that cause this thing to blow up? Can I include in the region of convergence? And the answer is, well, one cancels out the other, right? So in the end, it, it's a mute point. The, the two sort of cancel out. And it does happen. If you take your polynomial in the numerator and your polynomial in the denominator and you start um, factoring out into um, you know, those single order terms, and you get a pole and a zero that match, and you cancel out, that, that, that solves that, that situation. So just to let you know that that situation does, does occur. And, and, and some good reads on that is in section 3.5.5 and 3.5.6. Yes? Oh, no, it does. Yeah, so what happens is, um, what happens is, so, so imagine if you have your system function, right, and it's totally characterized by these two polynomials, by the numerator and the denominator, right? So if there's no cancellation, if I have a value that's equal to a pole, it's going to blow up. But what happens if I have a, 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 also a factor in the numerator that cancels out that pole? I can, uh, you know, they would cancel out before I have a chance to even have that system function blow up in the first place. So in that case, um, you know, you do the pole zero cancellation, it's no longer an issue about, um, you know, whether that, that item is in the region of convergence or not. Okay? So, yep. So a pole zero cancellation can be either in the region of convergence. Yeah, because what happens, so ju just look at the, the, you know, if we look at the expression, that's an excellent, excellent point. So, so if you look at this expression, like notice, like, you know, where, where does this thing blow up? It's when the denominator we have a P, uh, z equal p1, p2, p3, p4. But what happens if the numerator also has a root that cancels out? It all comes down to if you cancel out uh, the nom one of the terms in the denominator. So let's say p1 and q1 are identical. They, they'll cancel each other out. And then later on, let's say z is equal to p1. It's not an issue because there, it, it, there nowhere is there is there going to be a denominator that's equal to 0. Well, yeah, and that's the thing, because when you cancel, you don't have a pole anymore. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, when you derive it, yes. But what ends up happening is when you, when you express it, 
uh, and you simplify your system function, it, uh, and you plug in that P1, let's say in this case, it will not cause your denominator to go to zero. Okay? Uh, question? Yes, there is there is an order as well. Like you cannot have more zeros than poles, otherwise it will blow up. Yeah, so you have to you, yeah, so you have to have um the order of poles is added. Yep. I have to remember for five minutes. <laughs> Good questions. Um all right. And then last um actually this is what the last one. So uh, just, just like to, to round out our lecture, there is something called one-sided Z transforms. So they do exist. We're not really going to use one-sided Z transforms all that much in this course. Um, but one-sided Z transforms, essentially remember what the Z transform do domain, a Z transform expression is, N equals from minus infinity to infinity. One-sided just goes from zero to infinity. And there's a number of reasons for that, but essentially, um, it deals with whenever we're dealing with um, solutions where um, it just everything starts from time instant zero all the way to infinity, and it's represented by the z plus um, notation. And so, what does this do? So, first of all, we have no information about the signal for n less than zero. It's unique for only causal systems. So, it's only causal. We only have information that's defined from n equals zero onwards to infinity. And then the one-sided z transform of x of n is identical to a two-sided z transform of the signal x of n, u of n. So again, so let's say we really want to make sure that the signal is causal multiplied by a step function and you're all set. And so there are almost, there are a lot of similar properties, but there are a couple of exceptions which are time delay and time advance. Because it gets very tricky, because how do you time delay and time advance when you have something that's not defined for n less than zero? And so those are the only two places where you will have a distinction between that and the two-sided Z transform. Again, this is more for um, FYI that such a thing does exist. Um, but, in, but for most of this course, we'll be playing with two-sided Z transforms. All right. Okay, so um, with that, that uh, concludes uh, lecture six. Thank you. Okay. Yay.